Jim kind of touched on my, my past. I, um, I went back to school at age 38. I had a year in geography that I needed to finish in order to get a degree. Um, so I went back and got my bachelor's degree. Uh, first class that I took was a geography class, and that was it. I, I knew that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I, I, um, I just have a real passion for it. Um, so he went kind of through a lot of this stuff already, so I won't go back through it. Um, but anyway, today I wanted to talk about um, when I went to work for Edison uh, in 2008, one of the biggest projects in the history of Edison is the TRTP project or the Tehachapi, um, uh, the Tehachapi Renewable Transmission Project. Um, and it, we tapped into the East Kern Wind Resource Area, which if you take the 14 out through the Antelope Valley, you can't help but see those turbines out through the big wind farms. And then uh, the last five years, the big solar farms they have out there as well. Um, Edison ha is tapped, is interconnected <coughs> with several substations into that system. And that's that kind of the massive size of that project is what I wanted to go over with you guys today. So a little bit of, a little bit of background too was I wanted to, I wanted to kind of show you um, GIS, kind of what it, how it communicates better the more you add to it and what it really means. Because when I got to Edison, boy, they, they just really didn't know what I was talking about. So if I, if I put this up on the screen and say, this is TRTP, it's 173 miles of transmission lines, um, the capacity of 4,500 megawatts, which is massive, um, possibility of, of supplying um, power for 3 million homes. That's fantastic. That's, that's exactly what people want to know. Um, but that putting line run up to there means nothing. So you add a little bit of detail to it, it gives you a little more perspective about maybe what the problem is, or, or not problem, maybe what the size of this project is. And now you've got San Bernardino County, um, where the project ends. Um, this splits right through Los Angeles County and starts up in Kern. When you talk about Edison's territory, it's one of the bigger territories in California. It's kind of a misnomer that people think that if you're in LA County, you're under LEDWP power. Um, not necessarily. A lot of folks, a lot of folks don't know that folks in Edison's territory kind of splits Los Angeles with LEDWP. And so we do have a lot of customers within LA County. So this was just a kind of an animation I put together back, it was a really long time ago. Um, let's see if I can get it to start. Whoa. So it's the animation I did. Um, we, they were citing where the wind farms were going to be. And, um, let's see if it will play. Maybe not. Oh, there it goes. Right there. There we go. So just a kind of a rough flyover. Um, back when I was really passionate, I actually hand digitized all those points on the map. There's over 3,000 turbines on that map. <laughs> um, Google Earth was, at the time, was a much better rendering engine, and I had several talks with Esri about that. Um, but the problem with, with Google is Google is a wonderful viewer, and they look great, but you can't do any analysis with it at all. Um, you really, you kind of work your butt off to do that if you, if you could. Um, if you wanted to put those 3D t um, turbines in Google, you would have to put a turbine on each point one at a time. In ArcGIS, all you have to do is build your tower, set your, set your, your height that you want it to be, and hit it on one point, and it puts them on all of them. And then you can also change it by, um, and uh, it, you can also adjust the height with your attribute table. So if you had different different turbines that were smaller or, or taller, you could adjust that with your attribute table. So this is just kind of a rough run through. I guess it's not the engine was so bad. Uh, when you start flying over these turbines, it actually looks like the turbines are spinning. And it's not. It's just because they're so pixelated. And and I love showing that to the three D guys at Esri. They they were like. That's awesome. How'd you do that? I'm like, that's your rendering engine.
So when I got to Edison, I, I, I was two years out of school. I was working at HDR Engineering, and when I was at when I was in HDR, um, I was the only one in the building that knew how to spell GIS. Everybody there was an engineer. So they weren't really interested in GIS. They really didn't care. They just thought, you know, they heard some good things that GIS could help them do this drill, and they wanted to do something with it. So being being brand new out of school and in a new profession that I really had no idea what I was doing, but school doesn't really teach you how to do a project. You teach you how to use the software a little bit, and then you were kind of on your own. So um, I was raring to go. I'm like, this is awesome. I, I'm, I'm in, uh, I would go into meetings at, with uh, at HDR and my manager would look at me during the meeting and go, we can do this, right? I'm like, yeah, of course. No problem. We got this. And I walked back to my desk going, God dang, I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> and, uh, but being alone and having that carte blanche to kind of do whatever I needed to do to make the projects work, um, I was a huge success there. And I, I, I loved that job. I really hated to leave even though Edison was offering me a pretty nice package. Um, but it was, it was a great opportunity for me to get, to get good at my craft, what I really wanted to do for the rest of my career. Um, when I got to Edison, <laughs> the first thing I got was, I'm like, I'm like, Gary's ready, I'm, I'm, I'm calling engineers, I'm calling up clients and whatnot within the company saying, I, you know, I'm a, map, I'm a new mapper here, I'm ready to make, make some maps for you guys. What can I do to help you guys with this project? What can we do? And they're like, uh, you guys are nothing but glorified cartoonists. All you guys do are, are manipulate Photoshop. That's, that's your whole job. Yes, we don't, we don't, we don't do that kind of work here. And I'm totally shot down. I think, what? Oh, wait a minute. No, no, no. You don't understand. So then I would put together, well, an animation that actually worked. But I mean, I'd put together little, little things that would kind of um, excite them about what I was doing, and I would show them things that I could take their engineering drawings from AutoCAD, from uh, uh, Civil 3D, and move them into a GIS platform, um, and show them on screen to, to, a, to a point where they could actually see aerial photography underneath those AutoCAD models, and that freaked them out. Because this is like, well, this is all we really need. We need to see what's on the ground, but we never get to see that because AutoCAD is a black background with colored lines on it. Well, nobody knows what that is unless you're running AutoCAD. So the way they had always done it before was, of course, spreadsheets. Everybody knows what that looks like. And Excel files, and maybe you'll have a lat long on there, maybe you won't. Um, you've got structure numbers, you've got kind of identifiers on it. Maybe that's cool, maybe that helps. But I mean, if you're, if you're in an office and you're trying to explain to the senior VT why we need to put an access road that runs by this pole right here, <laughs> that table is going to tell you anything. So the other map they had was, I was just telling, I was just sharing with Jim, um, my boss, the guy that hired me, um, he was actually one of the original mappers, and he actually started the GIS department at Edison in 1999. And uh, back in the 90s, before he got to that point, he was actually one of the, one of the mappers that had uh, digitizing tables. They had big rooms that had tables like as big as this stage. And basically, you had these big arms that came over, and you projected, you set your projection manually, and then you manually drew lines to make these maps of the territory. And these are some of the maps that came out of that kind of drawing. We still have these maps in Edison. They still have a lot of valid information on it, even though it's old and kind of archival. I mean, this is an old right-of-way area. Um, it's showing um, the width of the right-of-way in here. These are document call-outs that tells you what, what rights we have to this. Is it an easement? Do we own it in fee? Because um, ba my background also is real estate. And uh, our, our GIS department, for whatever reason, we're in the real properties department of medicine, <laughs> even though we kind of support um, transmission distribution more in our group. Um, so that would be your geotip. And I mean, of course, um, with Esri, I could take that geotip and lay it on top of uh, aerial photography. And when you see it lay on top of that, and you can kind of see what the roads are that lead into it or what the ground is actually telling you. Um, if you have a piece in the fair, we'll probably have to have that one. I don't know if you guys have looked at Google Earth lately, but I think last time I looked it was a couple of years old, it was kind of scary. 
So, and, and here's the other stuff that we run off of. This is the archival AutoCAD drawings. Um, most of them are coming, coming uh, uh, an AutoCAD version of a PDF, which would be a PWF. Um, and they have these things just uh, in, in massive files, hard copy and digital. And they have their number, and they have a, they have a map grid. So somewhere back in the day, um, somebody up in Big Creek, which is like North Central California, um, where we have a lot of our hydro uh, generation, um, he was sitting in Big Creek. Uh, I got an idea. I'm gonna, I'm gonna help as in mapping of the future. Um, I'm gonna build a grid of these, what are they called, facility inventory maps in, in the AutoCAD drawings. And I'm going to build a grid for our whole territory. But the center of it, the, the, the or point of origin is going to be bigger. Well, so if you, if you don't know, it has to do with projection, right? So if you, the farther you project from the point of origin, the more uh, error you're going to get, the more skewing, it's going to be more, um, less accurate. Um, so I mean, you can imagine once we got down towards LA, you're thinking, okay, we're in an urban area. It should be really accurate. And I mean, the pole number that you know is like a mile that way. It's saying it's right here. And it's not. So there was a lot of data cleanup and things that we had to get through to kind of even just kick off TRTP. And uh, that was what we kind of got into. Um, yeah, I kind of, kind of went out more on the, on the HDR stuff. But um, the Edison team that I came into was fantastic. Um, they were all, they all had either been a, a professor at a university and was now, and was now pursuing a professional career in GIS, or they had, they had already been doing GIS or programming um, with other companies, uh, you know, in proximity to the Edison territory or nearby. So they kind of knew what was going on. They had a little bit of utility experience. Um, I had none. Um, basically, the engineers that we did at HDR was um, wastewater treatment facilities, and um, we did a lot of that for Montana, the state of Washington, and um, we did some, uh, some tax base analysis for impermeable areas, and um, that was really that was really kind of fun. fun but um, the NFT was ready. We knew what we wanted to do. We knew what we had to do. So. So we started kind of trying to figure out what all we need to throw at these maps and, um, and what kind of information was important to, um, what was important, like instead of just looking at that black and white map in the corner, this is, these are all the things we can show you. You know, we're showing engineers, you know, and we're showing um, environmental areas, we're showing um, areas where, uh, where actual ground disturbance um, and that really kind of lit the fire on the engineering guys that, you know, wait a minute, this GIS stuff is for real. We could really use this going forward. Because up until then, they had been using AutoCAD and emails and phone calls and field visits. Well, at the time, <coughs> I think Edison has reduced its rolling stock, which is trucks and cars, by two thirds in the 10 years I've been at the company. And primarily because of the because of the effects that GIS had on doing desktop analysis. So and this is kind of a hard slide to see, but and it's kind of busy, but I mean, you can kind of see what we're getting at with all the detail we can throw at these maps where they never knew what they had before. Um, we have parcel data here with an APN number, a special parcel number, so we could we plug that into a software um, from, from a digital map projects or go into a county website, type in an APN number, we know who the owner of that property is. Um, we have, we have road, road data, we have ground disturbance, we have, uh, I believe these are replacements. Um, it's just the, the level of detail and, and the amount of information we can get out there um, just made the project start to kind of roll and people start to kind of understand why we were So in order to get to where we could do all that kind of mapping and to make this thing streamlined and to go the way we needed it to go, um, 
first thing was meetings with everybody we can get our hands on. And I mean, any big company you know, um, you're going to have meetings until the cows come home before anybody ever comes to a consensus or makes a decision. <laughs> and we had that. Um, the main, the, our main focus of all these meetings right off the bat was we've got data coming in from, from uh, environmental, we've got data coming in from um, engineers, we've got data coming in from uh, archaeology, um, uh, construction folks are, are, are sending this data, all the data, it's all being collected differently. Um, some of it's AutoCAD, some of it's Excel files, some of it's spreadsheets or access databases. Or, and it, nothing is uniform, nothing is gathered. And, and, and then it's our job to basically combine it all into something and then make a map out of it that makes sense. And the, and the, hard, the hard thing that we were running into was all that time processing. Well, if we had a schema that's basically, basically a spreadsheet of our own, then it's simple, but I mean, that was uniform. So if we, if we submit the schema out to all the contractors and all the engineers and all the construction guys, and we say, the only way that we'll accept data is if you load it into the schema. And when you collect it, you have to collect it using the schema. Once we got that all, that took three years to get the full buy-in across the project. And it took three years to build because it was a tremendous amount of data. But once we had it built, it just made all the difference in the world. It actually, for all the fighting that we had, it was like, the, the big fight was always with a company that's 130 plus years old. We've always done it this way. We don't need to do it this way. And we got that so much. And it was like, no, 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 you don't understand. This is the future. This will change everything. And and over, over the course of my career there, that this uh, having a uniform schema across projects has changed everything for data management. Uh, we went from, um, you would, so, the project was so big, we had 11 segments. And so imagine, uh, say, each segment's 15 miles long, some are longer, some are shorter. But you had strip maps. So each map was about a 1,200 scale, which on an 11 by 17 page is about like yay. And um, it's, it's very detailed. It's very zoomed in. It's much more zoomed in than, than even that uh, view we had a minute ago. Um, so you've got one segment that could be 300 pages. Well, if one contractor went out to the field and ran over an owl, we have to remap that whole thing to show where that owl got run over. So even if we already did it that week, we had to do it again. And then, and then some other data would come in from, from environmental or from uh, field, uh, field crews. And, and any time that would happen, it would change. We'd have to change the mapping. Whereas once we went to the uniform schema, it was automated. We had it all automated. When anything changed, they would publish it from the field, and then we would just hit print, and it would print all 200 pages. And it was a piece of cake. There was no problem changing it. Before, it took extra man hours. We had to bring in extra people to put, put together a map on an emergency. Um, I averaged for for the five years that I was on CRTP, I averaged 30 hours a week over time. <coughs> it was insane. And I, I was always at the office. Lucky for me, I love what I did. So, <laughs> um, so the other thing, this is what they call a diagrammer. I don't believe they use the software anymore. Um, now it's moved to uh, Visio, which is still similar. But um, what this is, is this would be a feature class. This would be uh, an, attribute, an attribute table, and this would be the drop down, the domain value within that, so that, so that when we're sending our schemas out to the teams and the, and the environmental companies and whoever else is working for us, they don't have to guess. All their data has already been enter entered in there. All they have to do is hit the drop down and hit go, and that collects the data for them. And that was a huge thing for us. Um, just, have, just making their job easier made our job easier. So overall, the, uh, the number of stakeholders, this is just a small amount, but I mean, this really changed the way they did business because it, after TRTP, because it was, oh, 
it started, I believe it was October of 19, I think it was 93 was when we started on the first three segments. And those were kind of like a backbone set up up in Tehachapi area. And then, and then when I came on, they were just starting segment four. And so part of the project that I was involved in the most was four for 11. And um, once all these guys got on board with the, with the scheme change and being on board with working with us directly, they have changed. They, they continue to follow this model going forward with other companies. And other companies also approached us to see our model and just to see our team and how it worked and if they could basically steal off of that and make their own to make it work for their companies. And uh, it just really made a big difference to the project. The project started shrinking, the schedules were shrinking, everything was going fast. Um, it started kind of making the engineers a little sweaty because the engineers don't work really fast. <laughs> I've worked with them for a long time. And um, they really, they can solve the mysteries of the universe, but man, they're, they're at their own schedule. Let me just put that one. So um, what's the other thing we could do was there were places where we could build, um, we could build apps. Um, we're still pretty new. Um, it's not like now, um, Esri's really kind of taken off in terms of um, all the new stuff that's happening. I'm involved with a lot of it uh, with Edison right now. Um, but unfortunately, back in these days, we didn't really have a lot of, um, a lot of that, you know, the newer kind of technology, the newer um, ArcGIS Online and Arc Pro and that kind of stuff. But we did have, um, we worked with a, um, with a company, uh, one of our environmental a company wanted to help fund it. So we built this tool called Fred. It's, uh, it's the field, what is it, the field resource, the field resource environmental database. And what it was, you could actually go in the field um, to, to an area on a, uh, on a project, basically TRTP, if you were going through a high, uh, like, a, like a wetlands area, or somewhere that really needed to be studied, you needed to collect a lot of data for the, for the, uh, for the surveys. You can take Fred out there on a, on a laptop, or pads were still pretty new, but we had, we had uh, pads that you could use, or tablets. And you go out there and collect the data, and then uh, take it back to the office, load it onto a big computer, and basically download everything that you collected. And then we could consume that data into the mapping, which was really a, a, a time saver. And uh, that, the environmental surveys are one of the things that really holds up projects in a lot of cases. And it's, it has nothing to do with good or bad. It's just timing and like uh, some of it has to do with when, when birds are laying eggs or, or when things migrate through an area. You, you, it's just timing. It's just the way it kind of goes sometimes. But being able to consume this data so quickly and get it out to the projects, it, it cut that time. It made it, we, we could forecast ahead and we could, we could time it um, for as things were about to happen, we could already be in there getting, getting things done. Um, the other one was the Flex Viewer. And the Flex Viewer was kind of like the baby um, for uh, ArcGIS Online. Because um, once, once ArcGIS Online came out, Flex Viewer was gone. <laughs> it, was, it was designed um, from Adobe. Uh, what is it? Uh, it's not Adobe, the company that makes Adobe. Flash. Flash. Flash? Flash. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it is Flash. Yeah. So um, they made Flex Viewer, and uh, it was a great tool. We actually, um, we were able to work with them. We had some, um, we had some, uh, we just, we were able to build with them and special tools that you could have, um, they helped us write. We wrote some of our own. Um, it was a fantastic tool for what we needed and it was basically an online viewer for project assets. And so if you were in the field and something was about to change or you were changing something, you could upload it right there in the field and it would show on the map. I think it was about an hour um, it would pop right up and you could see it. Um, so you'd be sitting in the office and all of a sudden the right away changes a little bit and you're like, whoa, I, what did I do? <laughs> but, uh, but it was a really great tool for, for the TRTV project and it really, um, really kind of cemented the fact that clean data um, means a clean project. So from the, from the standpoint of a GIS professional, never overestimate your audience. So the reason why I say that is 
most of the time when I would deal with engineers, um, I would I would get the map and I would assume that they knew what they were looking at. You know, kind of like that, kind of like that squiggly picture at the beginning, right? That, that squiggly blue line. That was a TRCP right away. Well, I know that. Why doesn't everybody know that? We're all on the project together, right? Well, no, because there's people that just aren't as involved as you. And, and, and anytime you're a mapper or you're involved in a project like where you're looking at the same um, features or the same right away or the same piece of a project, you're going to know that better than anybody else in the company. And it's really easy for, for me to be semi condescending to an engineer that doesn't know his own project. Well, I learned that lesson really early. It's not their fault. It's just you're, you're, you're much more uh, ingrained in the project than they are in, in the amount of time that you spend viewing it. So don't overestimate that what you're showing, like, like, that, like, that, skinny, like that skinny blue line. Just put on all the extras, put on all the things that you want to put on there or that you know you need to put on there, and it's probably going to tell the story you're trying to tell. Always try to communicate with the maps. If you ask me for a map of everything on the project, and if I'm doing my job right, I don't have to say a word. I can just lay the map in front of you and say, here you go. Um, for a master project like this, uh, definitely be flexible. Um, be clear. Um, there's a lot of things that can get shady or um, hazy in, in the project this day. There's details can get missed. Um, at times, be vague. Don't let, let your GIS be a cartoon, because it's not survey. It, at times, it is a cartoon. If, if, you, if you're consuming survey data, it's still a consumption of something else. There could be some sort of error being included in that. So it could still be a cartoon. That's OK. But it's the story that you're telling. That, that, that's really what it's about. Um, they define exactly what they want and then be ready to change it because I guarantee that blue line they want it to be yellow every time. Um, don't be afraid to innovate and push the envelope. Um, I, uh, I spent a lot of time um, building 3D models and um, 3D renderings and whatnot um, through the beginning parts of TRTP only because um, I really had a passion for it and I thought it was really going to be a big deal. Um, it ended up being a really big deal. I was the first um, I was the first uh, GIS employee in the company to ever get funding to do, to do 3D work. So and I actually did a, I did a ton for TRTP. I did a ton for, um, at the time up north, because this, this runs right up really close to Tejon Ranch, where the California Condor Reserve is. Um, I had to do a lot of, uh, a lot of 3D flyovers um, uh, to show mitigations that we, we were we were going to try to uh, do to keep the condors out of the out of the and uh, there was a really innovative way that they were going to do that. Um, and whatever you do in GIS, people that don't know what it is, it will always blow them away, even if it's just a simple map. If they if they don't know what it is, they're going to go, "Wow, that is awesome." Um, one of the things I used to do in Montana, the second year I worked for HDR, um, we were working with an area photography company, and they did a one-inch flyover of the city of Missoula. So I mean, basically, you can zoom in and you can like count like shingles on the road, right? So um, if, if uh, like for example, I, I won a prize on a radio station, a radio college thing, where I got tickets to take my wife and kids to go see the Lippin' Thomas Towers, right? I thought that was really cool. And so I went down there and the guy said, well, I've only got three tickets. Well, I've got two boys and a wife. Now, what do you, <laughs> he goes, the, um, the, the, the director of the station came out and he goes, you know what, here, take my ticket. So I, I thought that was a really sweet thing for him to do. So the four of us could go and it was a great time. I went back to the office. I, I, I knew his name. I looked him up. I took a, um, an aerial shot of his house and framed it with the parcel line and, and put an HDR in there. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I framed it for him and took it to his office. And he's like, this is awesome. I love this. 
So it's like, I, I'm telling you, the GIS will blow people away, and it doesn't take much. So I, mean, I just wanted to bring this back around, just all the things that you could do with the data that uh, we collect in the field. And then, and then this is just that, that same shot, kind of uh, what we started to get into as the project pro progressed. Um, this is an example of a um, uh, acquisition status. So our, our department being the real estate, um, we had to define parts of the right of way that were um, how they were being collected. So if something was in the middle of a court case or you were trying to acquire rights or you were in the middle of a condemnation, we wanted to color code the, the strip map in such a way that you could flip through it. There's great big labels here with APN, owner name, you know, what the status of the project was, each piece of, each piece of property. Um, so this made a, made a huge uh, a huge dent in the acquisition stuff because everything they had done in the past was an Excel file and nobody was updating it. <coughs> in this way, this got updated every time you went, every time you changed something, it updated the attribute table and this changed, um, changed the way we did that whole process. So this was early on in the first couple of segments. Um, this was a really high res, um, <laughs> black and white. But it was really high res um, aerial imagery. Uh, so you could really, if you zoomed in, you could really see where the other towers were. This is where all the new stuff was going to be replaced. Um, there's a tower, a tower up there. There's, a tower. there's one right there. So it's kind of fucking being black and white and being on the screen that way. But, um, but those are some of the better images that we had and it was just a the way the flight went was like a big swath that went through the whole, the whole uh, right away. And then this is just kind of what I was playing with back in the day was ArcScene and ArcLow for 3D. Now I'm using ArcPro and I freaking love it. Um, it's, a, it's a really phenomenal tool. Um, but ArcScene is really fun if, if you have, a, if you have a, uh, anything that you'd be interested in 3D, ArcScene is really fun and it's pretty simple to use. Um, you can get in there and kind of flip it around and do some cool stuff with your train. Um, this is just, just an example of one. And then Arc Globe is another one. It's kind of a lot like um, Google Earth. Only you can actually do analysis on here. Um, and um, I did a lot of my flyovers in, in Arc Globe um, just because it's, it's an open world. I mean, you can kind of literally go where you need to go. Um, and at the time, which it's easier now, it's, it was easier then than it is now to download a really good terrain, at least in my experience. I've had a hard time finding the good stuff. Um, the, the, the nearest I've been is like a three, it's like a three meter, but I've got a download from Alaska, when I'm from Alaska. Um, but it's really good, it's really good imagery for, for building terrains or elevations. Um, so yeah, um, that's it. Any questions?